Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Claire Fox. I'm the director of the Academy of Ideas, and I would like to welcome you to this opening uh, session, opening plenary, should we resist the new normal. Um, before, before I start that part, can I just draw attention to two things? First of all, I really do want to thank Edwina Curry. Um, not words I ever thought uh, would, <laughs> she or I thought would happen. Because she uh, persistently encouraged us to do this. And it, it isn't always easy, especially because we'd had the lockdown, to know whether we shouldn't play safe a bit, just stick with the London Festival, which was a few weeks ago and had, you know, 1,500 people and it was a great success. You know, why would we then go and do this Buxton event? Very risky People didn't know where Buxton was and so on and so forth. But Edwina absolutely insisted we did it. And so can we just thank her for, for that? Um, secondly, to note that, that, that uh, Professor Dennis Hayes has obviously been the, you know, the real prime mover of involving us in this fantastic venue. But also, when he read out that statement... Um, from the Vice-Chancellor, I don't think you can underestimate how brave it is at the moment for a Vice-Chancellor to say that they support free speech and to invite people like, you know, us. And um, there were people, I know, that will have been saying to that Vice-Chancellor, um, do you know who they are? Do you know that Claire Fox is a lunatic? Do you know that these people have got people from all sides of the debate? Shock horror. And that they won't all agree on everything and therefore there will be people who are going to challenge some of the orthodoxies you're not allowed to challenge and isn't that risky? And I think it's a great credit to both Professor Hayes, his colleagues at the University of Derby and that Vice-Chancellor for sticking with this because it's ridiculous that you should say it's brave for a university to encourage debate. But do you know what? It is. It is. So thank you very much to the University of Derby. Um, and also, of course, uh, uh, to acknowledge and thank uh, uh, Mo Lovett, uh, my colleague who with Dennis has convened this whole event and, and carried the bulk of the weight around it. i just like to turn up to chair the opening session. But can we thank them all anyway? Um, okay, um, before I uh, introduce uh, the panel, just to kind of give a sense of what, what we were thinking of when we were, were, were putting on this particular opening session, it's not that we want this festival to be dominated by the coronavirus period that we've been through or the lockdown period. I mean, it's not... In a way, it's something that you want to forget. You want to get on and just pretend it didn't happen. But things changed things did happen. Something very substantial has happened to society and actually something very substantial has happened to the world because it's a, it was a global pandemic and we can see when we look around different countries just what kind of changes have been wrought by what was a very and is still a very serious virus. Now the, the, the thing that I want to sort of establish is there will be people here in this room who think that we should have locked down earlier, locked down harder, and that some lockdown restrictions should carry on. And there'll be people who think it was over-exaggerated. There'll be different opinions, and we'll cope, right? That's the point. We're all grown up. That's the idea. But whatever, not side you're on, but whichever kind of way you lent in relation to that, I think we can agree that one way or another the way that we reacted and responded to the pandemic had a massive influence on us socially and to a certain extent knocked the stuffing out of us because for a very long time we were atomised from each other. The reason why we're all saying it's unusual to be in this situation is because for a lot of people, when I met them at the London Battle of Ideas, for example, they literally had not seen anyone for months and months and months and months. Well, nearly two years. You know, they'd kind of been on their own, just with their families, and sometimes not even with their families. So we are now reading of all of the different things that are a consequence of this, such as the developmental problems that children are having. I know that 
that Jenny Bristow, who's going to be speaking, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about whether generationally young people have particularly suffered. We know that there's been terrible things that have happened in relation to people who have relatives in care homes and not seeing them and seeing them through windows and so on. So this is kind of really, I think, no matter what way you look at it, dented our confidence. And I myself feel that although I'm kind of on the, you know, let's get back to normal as quick as possible, I know that it's still a shock when you kind of are in a crowded space like this because you think, ooh, ooh, is it all right? And you're not sure all the time. And you're also not sure how um, you'll be... Uh, received if you argue certain things. I did any questions last night. You're going to miss the repeat today. It was awful, don't worry. And um, <laughs> the audience hated me. But, but one of the questions was, um, somebody asked a question whether we should be, have mandated mask wearing everywhere and whether it should carry on indefinitely. And they kind of meant it. And I said no, so that was, it went badly wrong after that. Um, <laughs> But it's also the case that my fellow panellists made the point, and I think there's something in this, that regardless of whether you... I do not wanted to have a row about the efficacy of mask wearing, because that's not what I'm talking about. But what people were saying was, well, when you wear a mask, it shows you care. And it shows... And I think that there was a real sense in which we all wanted to do and want to do the right thing. We are creatures who exhibit social solidarity. We're not all just selfish and say we don't care what happens. So I think that there's a, an enormous amount of pressure on us to, to, to do the right thing all the time. And so that's why the new normal matters. Now just a, a couple of other things that I think will be worth us considering in the course of this discussion and, uh, 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 and so on. Um, Something as wonderful as the vaccine in as much as a great breakthrough of medical science that's had such a positive impact in terms of keeping people safe has somehow become part of a culture war. You know, so rather than it being a straightforward medical discussion, suddenly science, vaccines, what you think about medicines is now massively politicised around mandated vaccine for NHS and care st staff, for example, vaccine passports, whether you're an anti-vaxxer or not, if you don't want the vaccine, what it means if your children uh, have the vaccine or don't have it. So somehow nothing is normal. That's all I'm saying is you can't even have a normal conversation about science and medicine anymore without it becoming a signifier of something else. Um, working from home is obviously, and, and somebody, um, Dennis, I think, referred to the face-to-face -face teaching. Quite controversial to say that. In a lot of universities, they're objecting to face-to-face -to -face teaching amongst the staff. A lot of students are not sure if they want it. Uh, working from home, then, is where people say, well, I now have the right to say I'm not going into work and I can do my job just as well at home and I can cut out all the hassle. Is that a positive thing? One thing that made me laugh, because I come from kind of vaguely journalistic world, is that um, at the beginning, when um, all those journalists in those press conferences kept saying, You're sa you say we're locked down, but the tubes are packed, who are all those people? Uh, it was more as telling about the journalists who didn't understand that quite a lot of people can't work from home. The very people that were actually servicing the lockdown, the people who were collecting the rubbish, the, uh, indeed the people who were keeping their Zoom calls going, uh, let alone the shop workers, and I don't need to do it, but they were kind of going, well, it's full of people, i.e. frontline workers who they'd never noticed before. Uh, but I, I think that even when now people are saying we should be able to work from home, there are a lot of jobs you can't do from home. So it, when we say the new normal, there's a lot to consider. And finally, just because I've uh, um, bizarrely ended up in the House of Lords, I've been keeping a close watch on parliamentary procedures, and it doesn't matter where you stand on this, Parliament's... Um, or, or rather the, the government's uh, power grab in terms of the amount of laws they have is something which all of us should keep our eye on very closely, let's put it that way, at the very least. And there was an emergency. They brought in emergency legislation. We can have an argument or not about whether that was good or bad, but the thing is they won't let it go. Right, they've still got it and they're still using it. So there are things for any Democrat, wherever you stand, to say, do we want the new normal to be that government has that power or do we want to go back to the normal where we, the citizens, the voters, uh, um, actually tell them what kind of laws we want and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of uh, premises on which we're discussing. So we've got uh, a, a panel and I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll speak. We've got Jenny Bristow, who's a senior lecturer in sociology at Canterbury Christchurch University. 
She's the author of Corona Generation, The Coming of Age in a Crisis, which she co-wrote with her daughter Emma during the first lockdown. Uh, Emma is uh, still at school, um, but has become an author. I mean, so the uh, coronavirus has had an impact on her. She's become an author, and I turned the telly on the other night, and there she was. I thought, oh, uh, some things are not that normal. Um, she's become a kind of star overnight. Um, and also, uh, Jenny is the author of uh, Growing Up in Lockdown, which is one of the letters on liberty, which was one of the things which the Academy of Ideas launched as a pamphlet series during the lockdown. But also, Jenny has written uh, prolifically uh, um, books, particularly on generational issues. Um, and one of my favorites is Stop uh, Mugging Grandma. Um, but can we give Jenny a warm welcome, please? Then we'll be hearing from Alexander Mackay, who is the editor of uh, Red Star Radio podcast, which is a twice weekly show now on an Anglo uh, and is an Anglo Canadian production. Alexander, along with his co host uh, Leila Meshwi, I don't know how to say it. Meshwi. Meshoey, um, has spent the, the last 10 months analysing the government response um, internationally um, um, in terms of how the COVID uh, pandemic has been dealt with. He comes at things very much from a left perspective and describes himself as a Marxist, which is a red flag to a number of people in the room, I'm sure. Uh, um, but uh, I, I've never met him before, but it's good to meet, uh, uh, as, a, as a previously known Marxist, it's good to meet one who describes themselves as a Marxist now. And then... Um, and so can we give him a warm welcome, please? <laughs> Next up, and I would suggest sitting on a very different side of the political fence, is uh, James Bembridge. Um, I feel as though I know James because we have quite a lot of interaction on social media. But I've only, now that I'm sitting next to him, I've never met him before. Um, but it's kind of weird, isn't it, when you've kind of, we form these relationships. But anyway, James is the deputy editor of the Country Squire magazine, what? Um, and is a, pr a prolific writer of essays, articles, and commentary. James has a background in international business and brand immersion. I don't know either. Um, he says he's typically conservative uh, in nature, but as a proud polemicist, is always, quote, eager to explore new ideas to solve old problems, even if that occasionally means embracing the radical. That's a brilliant way of describing what the battle of ideas is. So we're delighted to have James with us. Give him a warm welcome. Last but not least, we have uh, Graham Stringer, who is an MP, a Member of Parliament for uh, Blakely... Oh, God, I'm saying it wrong. Is that right? Blakely and Broughton. And um, James is one of the legitimate Members of Parliament. I am one of the illegitimate Members of Parliament. He's actually been elected and is answerable to the, elect uh, to the electorate, uh, for which I have great admiration. Um, Graham is a, on the select, com a select Committee member of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. He's also, very importantly, a Select Committee member of the Science and Technology Committee in Parliament, and he has actually a background as an analytical uh, chemist. He's a great supporter of Manchester and the North West, uh, but for me, the reason why I always enjoy having Graham involved in any think that I'm uh, organising is because he's a great supporter and champion of common sense and speaking plainly. And for, in Parliament, that is a rarity, let me tell you. Uh, can we give him a warm welcome, please? <laughs> the format is that all of the panellists get five to six minutes to kind of lay out some thoughts and ideas. And literally straight after that, we go out to the audience and it then becomes a public conversation. I'll take four or five contributions, come back to the panel, four or five contributions back to the panel. They're not, it's not a Q&A format. I mean, you can ask a question if you want, but it's more like, what do you think? Any thoughts? So it really is an attempt for us to get to grips with some of, of these issues. So, uh, Jenny, can I ask you to kick us off, please? <laughs> Thanks, Claire, and everybody. Um, it's, it's great to be here. Um, should we resist the new normal? Uh, yes. I mean, <laughs> uh, why and how? That's the, the trickier bit, and I've just got some thoughts to um, express on that. So um, it's a very weird concept, the new normal. Um, I mean, it struck me right at the start where simultaneously we had an unprecedented pandemic and then this discussion about the new normal as though it was a thing that was obvious. And you think, well, that, <laughs> that doesn't work. Um, and as a sociologist, I, I don't know very much, but I do know that norms grow out of society over time. 
um, and we were living in a very abnormal um, anomic time. And so what was this thing? I mean, it, it seemed fairly obvious from the start that the, the so-called new normal is a script imposed from above. It's not a norm. It's, it's something else. And it's also not the first time either. I mean, I think people have talked about the new normal before, but particularly after 9-11, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion there where, again, you have the kind of media, political, uh, intellectual elites sort of declaring a fundamental change in society and, and how things should be. And then you think, well, what is this? Are we going to have a new normal declared at 10-year intervals or 20-year intervals or what's going on? Um, so in terms of what this script of the new normal is, I think it takes two forms, both of which have a very undemocratic character, profoundly undemocratic character, um, and ascribe real kind of limits to people's expectations of, of social life. The first version of the new normal uh, is a kind of this idea that we should have a permanent accommodations, uh, accommodation to the limitations on our lives that were brought in as emergency lockdown measures. I mean, so this is in the context of COVID. I mean, so I, I suppose we're all familiar with, you know, the whole kind of because COVID excuse for why nothing works. You know, which kind of made a bit of sense in the first kind of couple of months, but, you know, nearly two years on, it's like, all because COVID. More importantly, the acceptance that everyday pleasures and freedoms that are just part of, of life, you know, just being able to, to, to travel um, to Buxton or, you know, let alone abroad or to see friends in your own homes or the, these things, you know, can be very casually and quickly prescribed with no debate and, and no clear rationale. Um, we can no longer take for granted that our children can be educated, you know, or that we'll be able to see a GP or all of these things that, I mean, people older than me, you know, older than my generation have grown up with being, yeah, that, that's part of the society we live in. And I think, so I think that the experience of that has been very um, d discombobulating for me and for a lot of people. And I think that it's very dangerous to sort of say, well, this state of emergency can just continue um, in this way. We shouldn't expect more. However, I think there's a, a more disturbing version of the new normal, which I can only make sense of as a kind of a, a year zero fantasy. And this is a version of the, this, this idea of the new normal, which well, it's when people actually get excited about it. They don't just go, oh, it's the new normal. They go, look, we're in new normal. And it sort of presents kind of the pandemic as a wake-up call for the need for radical change to society. Um, it, it sees it as a space where... Um, Ideas can be imposed from above about the kind, of, the kind of things that we should believe, the kind of ways that we should behave, a, a sort of a revolution without people, almost. And you kind of see this, I think, in some of the rhetoric of the zero COVID lobby uh, and also some of the kind of excitable uh, rhetoric of uh, sections of the technocratic left and also the survivalist right as it goes. I mean, I think it does sort of cross politics insofar as those labels make sense. But I, I find this, you know, again, I mean, this kind of year zero fantasy isn't entirely new. I uh, wrote about it when I was doing my research on the so-called generation wars. And within some of that discussion, there's this sort of kind of, a pop, there's this sort of idea of kind of willing on a apocalyptic conflict between old and young. You know, this is the sort of idea that's presented. And, and so where the young are going to kind of rise up against the old and this is going to drive through a whole set of 21st century uh, values, um, new behaviours, new ways of seeing things, new ways of being. Um, and I, I wrote in the, in the book, book Stop Mugging, Mugging Grandma, I mean, this isn't about young people doing it. It's more about this sort of an ideology that sees young people as a stage army to push through um, a kind of vision that comes from sections of, um, of the elite. And this is international, so it's complicated, right? It, it, it's sort of coming from, and it's not entirely coherent, but there is this sort of sense of, oh, look what we can do if we just don't have to worry about talking to people. I mean, that's the, the essential problem with it. So I think both visions of the new normal are entirely unappealing. Uh, the second's worse. Um, because it really involves a, an all-out assault on the past um, in terms of knowledge um, and history. You know, what, I mean, an assault on what we know about you know, science and pandemics, for a start, in the context of, of COVID, but more fundamentally, a real kind of assault on the norms and values that we've grown up with and the relationships that, we've hold de that we, we, we hold dear. Um, I'm, I'm probably not alone in saying that I've, I've found the past... 18 months kind of resulting in this real sense of kind of disorientation uh, where we don't really recognise ourselves or each other. 
you know, and, and we're just sort of at a loss um, in ourselves to, to know who we are, where we are, and who we can trust and what we're doing. So if I can finish just with a thought on um, how, <laughs> how to resist all this. I think, that is, I think it's difficult. I think it's more difficult, and I, I imagine we'll, we'll look at that in the discussion. But I think um, the thing that most bothers me is that alongside the, the kind of crisis of sort of knowledge and the assault on the taken-for-granted ways of doing things that, that I've described, um, we've been sort of stripped of a, a narrative, a, a way of making sense of the predicament that we find ourselves in. You know, so we see kind of wild conspiracy theories abounding to sort of try and make sense of what's going on. And that's obviously a problem. But also, you know, kind of more reasonable attempts to explain uh, or put different understandings on the situation are also dismissed as sort of misinformation or, or conspiracy theories. And there seems to be this idea that, you know, asking these kind of questions um, is not only wrong, but it, it's, it's dangerous, it's reckless. Um, and that has been kind of denormalised, if you like, that, that, that very openness of, of public debate. But if we don't find a way to have these discussions amongst people in society, I mean, rather than within the media, intellectual, political bubbles, and I think it's important to have those discussions there as well, I think we will find ourselves stuck forever in the new normal, which is why I think we do have to keep talking about the consequences of the pandemic, even though we really would rather kind of forget about it. Because... Otherwise, I think we'll find ourselves in this situation of being endlessly powerless, flailing, disoriented, resentful. Um, and what I think we need to do is to reclaim the, the, the point that asking questions isn't reckless. Um, it's actually highly responsible. And it is the only means that we have for a more constructive debate and an approach to understanding. Thank you. Thanks. A, a, a really useful overview to start. I, I, just when you were saying about the enthusiasm, you know that Facebook has launched this meta thing. Um, yeah. And, and that was very much like, if one thing we've learned over the past period of time is that we've got to find new ways of not being physically in the same space with each other, but actually socialising. And I thought, that's not what I've learned. I don't want to have learned that. Go away. Um, you know what I mean? Like, uh, but, again, great enthusiasm for that. Um, Alexander, and do forgive me, when, when you're starting to speak, I'm going to go and get the water and the glasses. But anyway, uh, but, That's okay. but, yeah, anyway. Alexander. Thank you. And thank you to the organisers for putting this on and inviting me along today. And uh, I think it's fantastic to actually see so many people actually keen to come out and discuss this, um, even though, as the previous speaker indicated, you're told repeatedly that you can't. Now, the phrase new normal is one that reflects a desire on the part of certain sections of the ruling class to uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. And it's along with phrases such as build back better, um, which uh, it's a, one of a series of nebulous pieces of advertising uttered by various vacuous politicians and their ever loyal scribes in the mainstream media. Now, the question of what the new normal is, and when we're discussing it, it is difficult to disagree with the judgment rendered by the French novelist uh, Michel Welbeck, who said, well, it's just going to be like the old normal, only a little bit worse. <laughs> and that's very much where I come from on this. And like, to understand how we've ended up in this situation of ever-recurring lockdowns and increasingly strident and hysterical propaganda coming from the, those in power and their friends in the media, uh, over the last almost two years now, uh, we have to understand how we got to this place. And we got to this place uh, not just over the last couple of years, but I would argue over the last 13 years, really, since the Great Recession of 2008, the political class in the, uh, the Western world, Britain, America, France, and the other advanced nations, have been engaged in what I would call a project of restoration. After 2008, we saw the governments in our own country, led by David Cameron, in America, led by Barack Obama, engage in a project of trying to restore what had fallen apart in 2008. And they thought they had been successful until we reached the point in 2016, when we get what they is derisively referred to in the press as the populist upsurge. You get Trump, you get Corbyn, you get Sanders, you get Brexit, all in the space of 12 months. And after that, it appeared that a large section of the political and media class in this country had utterly lost its mind. 
They spent the last five years in an ever escalating hysterical frenzy, claiming that the sky had fallen in, Brexit was going to cause Britain to literally sink. Um, Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage had literally pulled the plug out from the middle of the country and were going to drift away on an ocean of racism. Um, and of course, none of that claims to be the case. They also claim that Donald Trump was going to nuke most of the world if he didn't get enough retweets or that the, or that the repeats of The Apprentice didn't get enough uh, viewing figures. Um, all of this, when you take into account uh, the fact that we had been through over Brexit, Trump, and so many other things, an ever-escalating hurricane of propaganda coming from the ruling class in this country and across the advanced capitalist nations, trying desperately to put the populist demon, as they saw it, back in the bottle again, the, it concluding in an almost two-year-long panic you know, in, uh, culminating in the lockdowns and all the other control measures that were put in place makes much more sense because what the political class has been engaged in over the last decade is an attempt to restore things, an attempt to keep everything as it is. But in attempting to keep everything as it is, they've only increased the crisis because it does not, they are not capable of addressing the many things that caused the crisis in the first place, that caused the crisis of legitimation that 2016 represented for them. And now they're coming out with ever more absurd and grandiose visions attempting to address what they regard as the problems that were caused uh, or that triggered the events in 2016 and up to today. That's why you see things that, that, such as the ever vacuous and shifting slogan like Build Back Better adopted by both Boris Johnson and Joe Biden. It's why you see Macron giving a, uh, an even more vacuous speech than usual in, over his vision for France 2030. They are attempting by outlining these rather grandiose technocratic visions to address what they see as the problems of inequality, lack of democracy, lack of hope in the future that caused the 2016 crisis for them in the first place. Unfortunately for them, however, they are the least trusted and least capable people of leading their societies forward. Um, that's why all of their attempts will probably crumble into ashes. But also, I, I want to just address in, in moving on in the remarks now, uh, the things that have been real and that have been attacked over the last two years, which is the democratic rights, our fundamental democratic rights have been under attack because they rendered essentially our representative institutions completely meaningless for almost two years. We had rule by the executive, rule by the prime minister, or rule by whoever was running the prime minister's office, given that the current occupant of number 10 is about as capable of ruling the country as he is of deciding what he wants for breakfast. Um, the... And just to prove I'm not being partisan here, I don't think the alternative on the Labour bench would have led to any better result. Maybe it would have even been worse. Um, but democratic rights have been attacked, and as the previous speaker indicated, this isn't new. This has been going on for at least 20 years, right the way back to the, what was labelled the war on terrorism. Uh, we have seen a doctrine of what those who have come up with it, of responsabilization, pointing to the population, saying it's your fault that the virus spreads, it's your fault that there's climate change, you're killing the polar bears by going on holiday twice a year, it's not the climate change envoy flying permanently around the world in his private jet. Um, <laughs> And it's your fault the health service is collapsing because you went out last night. It's not our fault for mismanaging it, the political class. Don't look at us, look at yourself. And that is what has been done. It is a campaign of psychological manipulation that have been unleashed by those in power to de desperately try to cling on to the fading remnants of a regime which lost its legitimacy in 2016 and which continues to lose its legitimacy the harder it clamps down, the harder it uh, curtails democratic rights, and the more its supporters in the press and the cultural sphere scream at the rest of us who, from whatever perspective who dare to ask a question. So yes, the new normal must be resisted because it is just yet another rebrand of the failed old normal, but a little bit worse. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Alex. That was a, a really interesting perspective. Um, I, one, one thing that I think that might come up throughout the course of the day, actually, is that there is an increasing sense of people feeling politically homeless. And uh, that's something to kind of bear in mind. I know that, that you know, I, I actually just saw Trevor there from... Uh, uh, um, uh, and there are different political groupings growing up that are basically saying the old established parties don't work and it's worth considering if that's 
a new normal we want. But the other thing I just don't want us also to forget is that a lot of us did lose people who died of COVID, right? So that bit wasn't made up, right? There was such a thing. Um, there is. But, you know, COVID actually also shook us up because people we knew and loved died very quickly if they got it sometimes or were long-term in hospital. So we've got those two things kind of vying with each other. Um, so uh, let's see, James, if you uh, disagree so much with the sure uh, Marxist that. before you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure that I do so much disagree with him. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I actually wrote my opening speech um, in the form of an article. I hope that's it. No, that's fine. Cool. Okay. So here we go. Across the Western world, politicians heap disdain upon the democracy which saw them elected. The voters are now used to being threatened, coerced and shamed by their government. The Scottish Labour leader somehow managed to, to uh, make a suggestion so shocking as to surpass all three of these unhappy expectations. And as Sawar warned Scotland's unvaccinated citizens, not only that he knows where they live, but that they should expect to be visited with door-to-door vaccinations. Somewhat of a Gestapo ring to that. Most disturbing is not that Mr. Sawar thought there was political capital in this threat, but that poll after poll suggests he wouldn't be wrong in doing so. In this new normal, freedom is increasingly talked of as if it were some strange, niche concept to which any sane and selfless person must object. But in that sense, the new normal has echoes of the old one. For some time now, free speech and its adherents have been regarded with suspicion, as if um, free speech were a tool for bigotry rather than liberty. And given that the calls to censor usually come from a cretinous cohort of cat-hoarding academics and technocrats, it's somewhat somehow felt that opposing them is a low-status pursuit. Freedom has acquired an anti-intellectual image. It's no coincidence that the freedom v. safety debate slices the leave v. remain one neatly in two. Those who are irrevocably committed to the EU are the kind of people who are happy to delegate their thinking to the state, whether it be ours or a foreign one. EU EU advocates have taken an almost amorous interest in new COVID restrictions, salivating over every technicality and imposition they could submit themselves and others to. The New Zealand Prime Minister ministers to this neurotic and tyrannic desire. When asked if there will be two different classes of people between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, Arden replied, smiling like like a satiated snake, yes, yes, that is what it is. Arden's health apartheid state is, as with so many of these COVID measures, tyranny masquerading as decency. To kill God and to build a church are, as Albert Camus noted, the constant and contradictory purpose of rebellion. The new left hoped science would one day supersede God. The science did, but it demanded a similar sort of faith from its adherents. We are asked to follow the science, but never question it. Where's the science in that? Science is, is it not, intellectual curiosity. The curiosity towards lockdown is often shut down by people claiming we aren't qualified to be curious. Where did you study epidemiology, they ask. Same place as Piers Morgan, since you ask. (laughs) Given that studies are emerging which show lockdowns may have harmed more than they helped, hopefully we may now have a more reasoned debate about lockdown and its system measures, free from the sort of slurs and moral pronouncements lockdown sceptics have been subjected to throughout the pandemic. Recently... I heard a caller on the Jeremy Vine show called Nick, who in less than two minutes described in harrowing detail how lockdown had allowed his cancer to grow undiagnosed. When, out of desperation, he paid for a private doctor, Nick was unfortunately told that had he been seen by uh, in person, he would have most likely survived his cancer. Can you look them in the eye, the lockdown hawks ask? Well, perhaps they may finally show some sort of degree of contrition and look people like Nick in the eye. Although, given his prognosis, they may, may only have a few months left to do so. Thanks, Jones. I think that that proves that you are indeed the polemicist. Um, I, I um, just want one thing to know, as much as I would... Um, uh, like to uh, say this is you know reflects the splits around uh, remain and leave. Actually, the one thing that I've noticed is that it doesn't that much, um, because quite a lot of people I know who um, you know voted leave actually completely disagree with my um, more critical view about some of the lockdown measures. So it's it's actually cut across things. And one of the disorientating things has been that it's cut across left right. It's cut across some of the more recent kind of 
leave remain things. It's just it just proved to me that it was a bit more complicated for for me. Although I, I you know, I, 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 I like to kind of bundle people in, but I'm just I'm just not sure. So we can maybe uh, come back to that. Um, but I think that giving us that international flavour was actually very useful because it is actually really shocking when you look at what's happening in New Zealand and Australia and France and Italy and all this sort of thing. And when I say shocking, I mean, you think, oh, God, you know, it looks kind of quite liberal and mild in comparison with here. Um, although Scotland is almost getting there. But you know what I mean? Like, um, so anyway, final thoughts then. Uh, Graham. Thanks very much. I'm delighted to be in Derbyshire. <clears throat> um, since going to school, I've enjoyed the Derbyshire countryside. Uh, walking as I went to university in Sheffield, walked in Derbyshire. And I never, ever thought uh, that two people going for a walk in Derbyshire would be followed by a drone <laughs> and threatened. It is an extraordinary <laughs> fact. There has been a really serious interference with our civil liberties and civil rights over the last uh, 18 months. And parliamentary democracy, in many ways, uh, has, has failed over that period. Not only did I not expect people to be arrested for walking in, in Derbyshire, uh, Piers Corbyn, who I know and disagree with on almost everything, uh, was arrested and fined uh, £10,000 for opposing uh, the lockdown. Other people, and I make no political statement, I uh, disagree with Extinction Rebellion, disagree with Black Lives Matter in their way, but they had demonstrations and the police chose not to arrest uh, those people. That is the um, criteria, it is how you judge a police state, and I'm not saying our police have got jackboots in their, in their lockers at the moment, they haven't. But if people's civil liberties are attacked uh, while they are expressing their free opinion and whichever, and there is a discrimination against people with strong opinions about COVID and people with strong opinions about race, then that is passing power uh, to the police. At the time, 23rd of March, when uh, the lockdown started and uh, the emergency COVID uh, regulations were passed in both Houses of Parliament in a, in a day, my guess is um, nobody in this room, I may be wrong, has read that, uh, that Act of Parliament. It's 350 pages long, 102 uh, sections to it, and 21 uh, appendices. It's a long... It was passed in a day, nobody understood it, and the amazing thing is that the government barely used it. They made a choice to use health regulations, which had inappropriately in many ways, which had more uh, powers in them, and stopped parliamentary uh, scrutiny. Because if they'd used the, uh, another piece, this civil uh, contingency, not civil contingencies, it's uh, got another name, which are uh, legislation, uh, they would have had to only have the powers for 30 days and there would have been parliamentary scrutiny. There was very little parliamentary scrutiny. Parliament didn't meet uh, over that period of time. At the time when Parliament should have been meeting more than ever, uh, there was very little challenge. There was no authority for the Prime Minister and uh, Matt Hancock uh, to come on television at press conferences and announce new policies that hadn't been scrutinised and instruct people. There may well be constitutionalists in this audience uh, who have read lots of Acts of Parliament and read uh, the 17th century constitutional 
uh, acts, there is no power in the latest legislation or anywhere else uh, for ministers to instruct people in this country what to do. We pass laws, the police enforce the laws fairly and the courts make judgments on them. That's the basis uh, and of our, our life. At one time, 266 billion was passed without parliamentary uh, scrutiny uh, on by edict effectively. Now, I've spent most of the last 18 months talking to the major players uh, involved in COVID, the scientists Patrick Valence and Chris Whitty, the ministers Matt Hancock, and all sorts of academics and people affected by it. And a couple of weeks ago, we wrote a very uh, long report. And it was uh, reported in most of the papers. It was fairly reported uh, in, in most of the papers. Uh, and it said that uh, we could have saved lives if the lockdown had happened earlier. And indeed, it did say that. Uh, but it also said before it, which I think was the more important uh, part of the report, that the lockdown could have been uh, avoided if uh, the government had challenged the scientists. Now, that isn't to say that Patrick and Valence and Chris Whitty are bad people. They were scientists doing their best. But science works by challenge and disproving things, not by authority. And that applies to uh, what's happening in Glasgow this week, you know. There is authority about science, don't challenge it. Science should always be challenged, and that's how you move forward. <laughs> and if the government weren't prepared to do it, the Commons and the Lords should have done, where there are many scientists, particularly in the Lords of distinguished uh, pedigree. Uh, they weren't meeting, and it wasn't challenged. I lose lots of votes in the, the Commons, even when my own party's in government. I find myself in the opposite lo lobby. But it is about the argument. Eventually, if you believe in parliamentary democracy, making uh, the argument is important. And if there's one thing I would like to draw attention to. Um, most of the things Matt Hancock said won't be remembered in, in very long. Uh, but <laughs> this this... Uh, this statement should be remembered. It probably wasn't noticed as much as it should have been, but it should get into the dictionary of uh, quotations. He said, with science on our side, we can't lose. Now, what does that remind you of? Anything but generals and government ministers in the First World War. Replace science with God. It means he had absolutely no idea what uh, science was and he was trying to use it as a shield. And I'll finish by expanding a little on, on that point. It, the government was getting a taste uh, for power. One was reminded regularly of Lord Acton's uh, statement that power corrupts, absolute power uh, corrupts, uh, absolutely. And the government took power, they had a taste for it, they got some things right, many things wrong, but it went unchallenged. And at the base of uh, a lot of the uh, new normal, whether it is uh, COP20, uh, COP26 or whether it is the, the wokeism that says, my feelings, uh, I might look like a man, I might be biologically a man, but I feel like a woman, therefore that is more important than the science and the biology. The subjective feeling is more important. I've got control of uh, COP26, uh, so don't dare challenge me. My right to carry on doing this is the, uh, is the most important thing. So I think that the new normal is, should be challenged. It is fundamentally uh, anti-democratic and will lead to extraordinarily bad things in our society. Thank you. Uh,
thank you so much, Graham. Extraordinarily important because I think that it's, it's easy to just kind of dismiss what's happening in Parliament as kind of like they're all liars and I don't believe them. But actually, that doesn't help. We actually need to know exactly what's going on in Parliament and follow it carefully and be able to quote those things because it's done in our name, as it were. I mean, parliamentary democracy is done in the name of the citizens of this country. And so, therefore, we need to follow it carefully. And with uh, Graham on the Science and Technology Committee, it helps because that report is worth reading and it gives you the detail of it so that you can't just be on the receiving end of decisions, but you actually are able to take control of them by understanding them. So, thank you very much, Graham. OK, straight out to the audience now. Hello. I'd just like to have some sort of clarification about the context for this discussion of the new normal. I mean, put crudely from my point of view, from my point of view, it's like lots and lots of people were dying, and I was very frightened of being dying, of, di being, of dying myself. Yeah. Now it seems that not so many people are dying, and I'm not that frightened of, being di of di death being, because of COVID. Uh, what actually... It's other people's opinions of the, the context for this discussion. Because that's the fundamentally my sort of um, fear. It's all wrapped up with death, its imminence, and um, the fear of death. OK, and that's very important. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'd like to echo that point, because I think uh, many of the panellists had turned this into a discussion about us versus the ruling class, the, uh, uh, the media elites, the government. But I think that there's a personal involvement that we've all felt over this past 18 months um, because probably for the first time we have been terrorised. We've, we've essentially, by being part of this community, we have, been, uh, we have indirectly given sanction for a state that has felt it okay to terrorise us. And I, as a result, personally feel tainted by that. We have set, as a community, a thoroughly bad example, I think, to the next generation. We have, we have allowed them to see that it is okay to override human rights, like freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of association. That it's okay to have arbitrary arrests of people doing something as simple as sunbathing, and all because of our fear. I think we have unfortunately as a community shown remarkable gutlessness and therefore I don't think it is just about opposition to those people who led us so badly including the formal opposition sorry Graham um, but you know and, and in fact all of the other opposition parties including my own we, we, we have all been through a a process which was, which was described by those people who commented on, on the origins of fascism as small people, small men, just wanting to obey rules. Okay, thank you. Right, so, yeah. So, that gentleman there, and then that person there. Yeah. One of the, uh, one of the, sorry, it's the No, no, sorry. It's, it's Hello? Person, no, no, no. That it is me. That first, and then you. Right, okay. Um, Graham described the process by which, in March 2020, Parliament, in effect, abdicated. Um, it is pretty much an iron law of history that if you abdicate, you never get that power back. You know, as Vladimir Putin, a political expert, uh, famously put it, if you have power in your hands and you throw it on the floor and you trample it like rubbish, you do not get power back. So my question really to all of you would be, what exactly, in that context, are we supposed to do? We should resist the new normal. How? Yeah, no, fair, fair, fair comment. So I've got... Right, so I've got this gen... This gentleman here. Uh, yeah, just a question for the panel. It, 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 uh, it seems to me that, that you know, this question around the new normal is one, one of the real key points of it is, sorry, one of the key uh, attributes is, is this constant sense of emergency. There's a, there's a, there's a real um, uh, lack of willingness to get back to how things were and to create a, a new sense of emergency. And the, you know, Graham alluded to the, the COP26 conference that's happening next week. And it seems to me that lots of the, the um, elements of the COVID emergency are just seamlessly transferring over to the climate emergency. 
Uh, so, you know, a sense of constant sense of fear, a sense of what is the risk is actually determined by a very small group of computer modelers uh, who make their own assessments about the numbers they put in and, and point to various things as, as, as the threat. Uh, a sort of morality about how you behave as to what is a morally responsible thing to do and to be a good citizen is to not eat meat or, or, or fly or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and, and, and constant restrictions. So I'd just be really interested to see if, if people think that this, this constant sense of emergency is, is, is almost like th that is the key defining factor of the, of the new normal and how much this is going to migrate over to climate, which is you know, a permanent emergency which will, which will never end. Okay, thank you. Um, so... I mean, there is a spectre haunting this entire subject... Um, that, that spectre um, goes by the name of Klaus Schwab. He, I, I only wish that it were true that Build Back Better was a vacuous statement. It is not. It is part of the Great Reset, which is a conspiracy which is happening in plain sight. And if, I encourage everybody to look at the World Economic Forum website to download the fourth Industrial Revolution book by Klaus Schwab, he sets out in there that this is not a vacuous statement, that you will have nothing and you will be happy. Those are instructions. That's not a suggestion. This is coming entirely from a new sort of fascism, um, a techno-fascism, that Klaus Schwab is inculcating in Canada, where they're saying this, this mantra of build back better, in Britain, where they're saying this mantra of build back better, and the one point, well, it was going to be 3.5 trillion that was going to be spent on this project in America. That seems to have been curtailed somewhat, but it's still going ahead, and that is the elephant that is in the room that is going to sit on everybody if we don't watch it. So, so, just, so just to say that I personally think that's rubbish, but it's all right, because it's quite popular rubbish, and there's quite a lot of people who believe that this is a plan. That's one version of it. There are other plans that I've heard. I get sent every day at least 25 versions of different plans um, um, on Facebook, and I think it's perfectly legitimate that that gentleman argued that, because... I, 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 when I say I think it's rubbish, it doesn't mean it's rubbish. What I'm saying is there are a lot of people now who have embraced a lot of these ideas and I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that that in and of itself is part of a bit of a new normal because I am constantly being told, no, Claire, it's a plan, it's this plan, that plan, that plan. And that's interesting. So that person there who's got the microphone, then I'll come quickly up to the panel Grab one thought you want to say, right? Just something you want to come back on, anything. It doesn't, or not specific, but anyway, yeah. <coughs> so, um, with respect to working from home, um, which has been mentioned as part of the new normal, possibly, um, it's very attractive to, auti to the autistically inclined, um, but dangerous for us as a society. Um, too much grooming into silos, especially men, where women are excluded and made it into meat or prey, instead of normal people or our colleagues at work, however irritating. On Wednesday night, uh, most girls boycotted nightclubs in Manchester due to fear of spiking of various sorts. How does the panel feel about this? Okay, thank you. Okay, so... Um Right, Alex, I'm just going to start with you. Just anything you want to pick up. Yeah, just on the gentleman here's point about actual risks and what, they, what was actually engendered this. My point has always been that the risk associated with COVID as a virus could have been managed rationally as part of a, a decently organized, democratically debated public health plan. We had a pre-existing pandemic preparedness plan in this country that had been tested over a decade and that was abandoned in a panic move by the government inside about two weeks in uh, March of last year. Now, everything that they've done since then has actually, I would argue, compounded the situation and made it worse. We knew early on what we knew early on 
Who was most at risk of COVID? We knew that we knew um, from the experiences in Southeast Asia where it began, like how to actually um, offer protection to people who were most at risk. That was not done. People who were most at risk were shoved into care homes and left to die. Disgracefully, Johnson should have gone over that. And the, the abandonment of that previously existing plan, the refusal to discuss, the adopting of a strategy of lockdowns that they took out of the Chinese experience with no guarantee and no evidence that it worked, it's, it is the dealing with this in an irrational and a hysterical fashion because they failed to actually interrogate, as Graham suggested, the science properly. And the, and the cabinet and the prime minister abdicated their responsibility to build a rational and coherent response and chose arse covering and melodramatics over decent policy. Okay, thanks. Right. Jenny. Shh, shh. Okay. Um, I, I, right, put your hands up and then I'll take you again. But no, no, not yet. I mean, I was saying to that gentleman, right, Jenny. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with a lot, a lot of that. Um, and, but it, on the context, you see, at the start, I mean, but people were dying. It was a new virus. Its effects were unknown. Uh, treatments were unknown. Being scared was very, very rational. And you see, this is the topsy-turvy world I often find myself in because I'm thinking, we didn't need a lockdown. You know, I live in a, a small town. You could see people's behavior adapt, right? According to the fact, everyone was like terrified. And there were people in my small town before lockdown, many commuters to London, who were very, very ill, couldn't get any access to health care. Um, you know, and it was, and, and I looked, you know, so I kind of dove into the stats. I'm not a scientist. Um, but, you know, you want to know what's going on. I looked at it, I thought, okay, well, I don't need to be worried about my kids. You know, few. Terrified about other relatives and people who I knew who did seem to be more at risk. And then you kind of find yourself in this sort of peculiar situation where then people say to you, well, you weren't taking it seriously. You think, but I, I took it very, very seriously, actually. My frustration with lockdown, as you say, is that then that kind of like performative, population-wide, universalised risk, completely inappropriate strategy got in the way of actually doing more effective solutions on a policy level, of which, you know, I could, we could debate all of those, but they're not that complicated. And whilst I think that was sort of forgivable a bit in the panic of those early months, what was less forgivable was when we went into the second wave and, and onwards, where they still, there still weren't fever hospitals, there still wasn't, you know, there, there still wasn't a kind of thing about di differentiating well people from sick people. Very obvious principle of... Um, disease control and so I could go on but th this is the, the problem with it and I think so I think your point about the context is entirely kind of apposite and I would say that the person who said you know kind of we're all complicit in you know the fear and I mean I, th I do think that's true I think that's that's disturbing the thing is though I don't think that's always a negative thing so at the start people's fear is something that could have protected us, and probably did, actually, because, you know, the cases go down before the lockdown happened, you know, and all of those kind of things. But then, as things have gone on, it's kind of like we've kind of become engaged in this sort of morality play, which has become more and more detached from other questions that, as humans, we think about health and also what else we want to do in society. I don't know if that makes sense. but So I think we shouldn't see the past 18 months as, like, one flat tail, and it's very hard to remember what was happening back in March 2020, but we do need to try and do that. Okay, thanks. Graham. Sorry, I'm not trying to stop you clapping, but anyway, we haven't got time. <laughs> right, Je uh, Graham. There's a sort of feedback mechanism of fear and terror. The government were terrified, uh, like lots of governments are, they're going to get thrown out at the start of this pandemic because the NHS wasn't up to it. The number of, our level of intensive care beds was much lower than elsewhere in Europe. Part, I'm, not, I'm not sure this was thought out, but therefore the government started taking actions which frightened uh, the public to a greater extent than is normal during uh, infectious diseases. The year I went to university, uh, 1968-69, about 85,000 people 
uh, died of flu that year. I don't remember a single notice about infection control at that time. Now, it's difficult to know, and we won't know for some time, how many people have died in this uh, epidemic uh, and who has died, but it is not as unprecedented as the government said. There was, they were terrified. They terrified the public for the first time, I think, in our history. Uh, healthy people were locked up uh, as, as well as vulnerable people and uh, sick people. Uh, it was a serious uh, damage to our civil liberties. And the user, somebody mentioned this, and I think it's absolutely right. Uh, the use of emergency, either in language or legislation, it should frighten everybody. And that's when people should start saying, we want more uh, say in Parliament, we want more votes on this, we want more information. On the Science and Technology Committee, it took us months to find out the membership of SAGE to get the report. We won. You know the membership of SAGE now. We got the information out. But that's uh, when people start saying emergency, they close things down. We need to uh, <clears throat> make sure we get the information out and don't have unnecessary emergency. And the final point to the gen gentleman over there, you're right. The Labour Party in opposition uh, failed. The, I, I understood it at the, in March. Uh, nobody knew what was going to happen. Uh, nobody wanted to play party politics. But after that, there were clearly mistakes. And it was a huge mistake for the Labour Party to say they wanted more restrictions rather than to say uh, that the government had got some things right and got some things wrong and they should change track. Okay, thank you. So, so, listening to the gentleman that talked about Klaus Schwab, um, I don't agree with that either. But again, more power, in, power to him for saying it. But it, it's occurred to me that um, both the sort of lockdown hawk extremists, you know, those for whom masks are not just a protection but sort of religious garb, um, you know, they, they sort of stand pointing at those who don't wear them with these perpetual stares of pious fury. Those... And also the ones on the sort of um, feral fringe of the lockdown sceptics who buy into all these conspiracy theories. I think they suffer from the same condition, which is almost like a sort of bulimic anorexic. They want to do something which will make them feel a sense of control over a sort of chaotic, what has become a chaotic situation. So those on the left, uh, so on, you know, lockdown hawks, they wear the masks just because it's an answer to what was a sort of misunderstood, uh, understood threat. And then those on the, uh, uh, the lockdown sceptics, the extreme end of that, they, they buy into these overarching conspiracy theories because it helps make sense somehow of the, what is often the sort of inexplicable sanctions our governments have imposed upon us. Okay, thank you. Right. So, so um, where, where's the microphone gone? Right, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's just a small point in relation to understanding conspiracy theories and why they've come about, and I'm glad that James used the word inexplicable, because part of the problem, I think, is that there's this tend, you know, part of the new normal and the way in we're under, trying, being told that we're supposed to understand it, is this creeping sense that government has had a plan all along and that actually that government and institutions have had far more authority and have been able to make sense of things and have taken decided actions I think far more than they have the experience of the last 18 months as far as I can see it has been flailing one from one thing to another whether it be superficial things like you know running through health ministers because they're off having affairs with mistresses or you know having uh, open spats with your with Dominic Cummings and your advisors and government flip you know jo Boris Johnson goes going from someone who was um, celebrating shaking hands at the start of when we all were quite frightened to now being, you know, a complete, um, a, you know, having a sort of conversion to a, almost a coronavirus obsessive shows that actually you, there is, there is um, the more complicated and inexplicable position, which is that we have a government that's enacting very authoritarian measures but doesn't have any authority and doesn't actually believe in its sense of having a plan. I mean, in some ways I wish that there was a kind of, I don't quite wish that there was a great reset, but wouldn't it be more 
understandable if there was a if there was a linear line which you could understand the steps that were being taken part of the problem is that there hasn't been and what strikes me as neither new nor normal and particularly not new is this trend to see people either as gutless sheep or who you know won't um, raise their head and make a, a decision or an informed decision around coronavirus and indeed as um, Graham String was talking about the move to be this sort of lazy anti-democratic strain which is that the, just the default position is to not question the default position is to um, uh, enact things without consultation and that's not normal from as Alexander's saying from Brexit and beforehand that's been a strain in politics for a very long time so rather than grasping at conspiracy theories I'm not saying that we kind of wallow in the inexplicableness of all of this but suggesting that there has been a plan or an authority behind this I think is the answer is actually far more dangerous that we're flailing around the government is okay thank you so 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 this, you, you, and give the microphone to that gentleman in the blue shirt. Yeah, yes. Um, I was just wondering about the uh, power of opinion polls in this new normal. Obviously, governments in the past have used opinion polls to gauge their policies, see how popular they are, but it seems to be a lot more intense with, since March 2020. Um, you know, if you go on social media, the government will announce a policy or suggest a policy, and apparently it's got 85% support. Look at the budget, for example. Rishi Sunak gave the budget out, and immediately there was a poll saying it was so popular. How many people in here have read that budget? Bet nobody. Probably Baroness Fark, but <laughs> not the rest of us. Um, mass mandates. Apparently 85% of us want mandatory mass mandates, but every time I go out, I don't see that. If you want to wear a mask, great, but I choose not to. And the polls are not showing that at all. They actually show me as somebody who's absolutely insane, because apparently... 85% wanted mandatory mandates, uh, mass mandates, but 15, I'm the 15%. Well, I don't, we're not 15%. I'm not saying we're a majority either, but we're more than 15%. So the role of opinion polls is being crucial in the government and seeing, seeing that as an endorsement of their policies. And that's made us all fearful because I look at that and go, God, am I the weirdo? Perhaps I am sometimes. <laughs> Sorry. Perhaps what I say sometimes is crazy and that's fine. I have to keep, every day I keep thinking like my lockdown skepticism, is that the right thing? Is that, I have to do that every day just to make sure because I have a dad that's incredibly ill and I want to protect him and I want to protect myself. So I have to make sure that I constantly look at this stuff every single day. And just one other thing. The new normal probably is as well that the government can do extraordinary things. So apparently it can resolve climate change just by getting an electric car. Just do that and change your boiler. Solved, according to Boris Johnson. That's the new normal. Apparently I can just change my gender immediately by just declaring I'm a woman. You know, that's the new normal as well, apparently. So it's just absolutely insane. No, it's all right. I, oh, no, no, just hold on. Oh, no. Oh, he's... He's taking an active role, right? It's that lady there with the blue, you, you next. But it's not you next. It's that gentleman there and then you. Yeah, yeah. Just a quick question for Graham, if I may. I appreciate his acknowledgement that the opposition made mistakes, but when does he think they might start opposing again? <laughs> when? Um, thank you to the panel. Um, I'd, I'd like the panel's point of view on resistance and the role of the internet in all of this. Because um, Alexander talked uh, quite rightly, I think, about the global financial crisis of 2008. But what also happened around that time, 2007, was the launch of the smartphone, the iPhone. And ever since that time, us, over time, normal people have had access to the internet. We've been able to build communities, connect with other like-minded people and do this globally, not necessarily just in our own locality. And this is a real threat um, to the institutional authorities and the official narratives that perhaps we've, we've had in the past. Um, it's my contention, actually, that we'd never have had these lockdowns if we hadn't had the internet because it just wouldn't have been possible. We wouldn't have had all the videos from the Chinese in the first place. You wouldn't be able to do online deliveries. We wouldn't have had the propaganda pumped through the pipe of, you know, uh, of the internet. And so, very quickly, we seem to have got from this place to the online safety bill and things like that. So my question to the panel is, is the new normal online freedom or online safety and surveillance? Okay, thank you. Just hand it to that person. now because I can't get everyone in. Right, so you and you next and then you two. There's a bit of a gathering. Yeah. 
So just a question and a very quick comment. People seem in lots of places to be asking, what do we do now? So I see that as a really positive question moving on from the analysis, what do we do? So you as a panel seem really quite united across very broad political spectrums. So the question I've got for the panel is, what doesn't the idea of protection actually justify? So if there is a plan written elsewhere, whether it's Bill Gates or whoever else, then my response is not it's simply no. Like People do have agency. The future isn't already written. Um, and I think we just simply need to be brave enough to take these debates elsewhere, out of this dome and out of Buxton, especially if Parliament is so slow. I mean, those months to find out who was on the panel advising Parliament and with no opposition, come back to the question, what do we do? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I just kind of wanted to bring up a lot of the stuff about government in the idea of democracy being quite detached from what people seem to believe because I think throughout all of the issues we're seeing today with the crisis the lady over there mentioned with the nightclubs and the ideas about women's safety alongside all of the stuff going on it's that question of what do people actually believe and what do media and government think that people are actually believing and the question I wanted to ask was how you think we should solve this because in doing you know, government and democracy, you think before it was said, you know, referendums were, were terrible, like tyranny of the majority. You're not going to get what people actually think. But when the government isn't listening or paying attention to wider attention, is that what we need? I remember I listened to something this morning where they were saying that COP26 is not listening to the people that are worried about the living standards, the decreasing. So are, is what we need, actually, to have a brief period where we take back control through referendums like even if Brexit was unpopular at least it got done in some sense and at least that's what was voted for by the majority and with a government that's completely failing to listen to broader opinion does the panel think that referendums is what we need okay thank you <laughs> right. so, some, some, whoever's got the microphone over there stand up I, when I'm pointing yeah you speak give it to that person there yeah yeah um <coughs> I must admit, I was a little bit surprised at your response, Claire, to, to this gentleman behind there, wherever he is, right? When he was talking about, um, is there a global conspiracy? I'm a bit surprised because it's the dismissal of it, right? I'm not saying that this particular conspiracy going on or another version of it over here or another version over there, but there's no other way of explaining what's happening, right? There's no other way. I mean, the gentleman over here at the beginning was going on about how everybody's afraid all over the place. We're all going to die out of climate change if we don't, you know, in the next 10 years. Or we're all going to die of COVID. Suddenly all these things have come upon us. And there is all these international bodies pushing it and promoting it. So if it's not this particular conspiracy or that particular conspiracy, there certainly is a lot of like-minded people, right, running the world, which you have to explain, right? Well, you know, open the, the southern US border, just open it, the whole border. Anybody can come in, anybody. And they're going to start paying people for coming in, the government there. How do you explain that? Well, you know, well, I mean, anyway, that's just on that. I, I really would like you to explain that. Just on, just on, is it Al Alexander, is it? Right. Um, it's a long time since I've heard a Marxist analysis, right? I used to be a Marxist myself. So it's a long time since I've heard a Marxist analysis. I just want to know how you get. I can understand from the same process, right? You know, the Christ, the same crisis. You could emer get the emergence of, of uh, Donald Trump on the one hand and Brexit on the other hand. And on the other side, Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders, right? I, you know, I can see that, but I can't see these calling, lumping them all together and saying this is populism, right? Because on the one hand, the Bernie Sanders et al, they're in line with the global, the global, um, new global, that, yes, the new elite, right? The same policies, open borders, right? Transgenderism, whatever, you know, anything you can name, right? Pro-COVID, pro-COVID lockdowns and all the rest of it. They're in line with that. Whereas the other side, like Graham and 
other people, right? He was one of the few in the Labour Party who was for Brexit. Well done, sir. <laughs> right? Right. Or on the other side. Right. Yeah, no, I wasn't sure. That was abrupt. Right. So, so the first thing is, is that you know that bit about free speech allowed? I'm allowed to have it too. So if I think someone's rubbish, I'm allowed to say it. Um, and, and, you, and, and, and the point about free speech is you don't have to agree. I've got no more authority for my opinion than anyone else in the room. But my opinion is equal to everyone else in the room. It's either rubbish or not. No, I'm, I'm just making the point about how the battle of ideas works. I can say something up here. You can say it's rubbish and I don't care. That's fine. <laughs> no, no, that's fine because that's the point, right? But don't expect me to pretend I'm a neutral chair who doesn't have an opinion. You've come to the wrong event. I mean, <laughs> that's not the way it works. Right, there you go. Uh, oh, yes. No, the, somebody over there got... Right, that gentleman there who's got the mic now. You stand up and speak. It. Yeah. Hi. Right. Um, the, the chap near the, near the start who mentioned how we're losing our fear of death... Um, obviously, my prayers go out to anyone who has actually lost anyone. I don't mean to be insensitive, but the truth is most of us won't even know anyone who has died of COVID. And so that's possibly a reason that um, our fears have, have lessened. And also, um, I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, but no, as far as I can think, apart from one who is over the age of 100, no famous people have died of COVID either. So not only do most of us not know anyone who's died, but we don't know of anyone who's died of COVID. So um, um, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, also, th this chap here who mentioned um, the polls, um, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Nadim Zahawi owns or formed or runs uh, YouGov. Um, and just very finally, very quickly, um, I, I, I've just started a job in the civil service relating to the new normal. I've just started a job in the civil service I've done six weeks of training, and it has been terrible. It's all been on teams. Um, I'm going to be a work coach in the DWP. Um, me and all my fellow trainees, and I know this because of the breakout rooms which you, we go into on teams. Some of you will know what I mean. The training has been woeful. Um, beforehand, it would have been six of us in a room in a class with a physical manual, um, really structured. Now it's 25 of us being taught on, on teams, and I've, I'm worried both because I feel very nervous. Also, I'm going to go into... They're, te they're telling me on my first week in work, I could be working from home, even though I feel so woefully unprepared to do the job, which you taxpayers have actually paid for me to train to do. And I also... Uh, I mean, I fear that uh, there's a whole generation of civil service workers and other workers and students as well who've had to go through this Teams experience who are going to be woefully unprepared. I... Do fear that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, so listen, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. That gentleman's got to, the, the thing. Then it's Mo, then it's that lady there, then I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Hello, thank you. Um, I'd just like to say that I think at its heart, there's a battle going on here between, on the one hand, people who think that us, the public, should broadly be in charge of our own lives and people who believe, we can call these people fascists, communists, socialists, progressives, collectivists, people who think clever, sophisticated officials should run people's lives for them. Historically, those people have never been stopped, and this is a bit alarming, I think. They've never been stopped except by force, unfortunately. People who, who want to control our lives have to be told, no. No, you can't control our lives. You can't rule us. We won't have commissars. We won't have Gestapo. We won't have Stasi. We won't have any other totalitarian nonsense. It's not something that can be won with debate like this. I'm not saying that debate isn't important. Of course it is. But these people are not interested in being stopped with debates. They can only be stopped by force and being told no. Um, uh, but, right, so... Uh, I've, got, I've got very, very um, little time, and we've got a full day, and we're not going to resolve it. I mean, I do think that you can actually resolve things through debate and ideas, and uh, those people who think that you have force, if that force is not informed by ideas, then it's a complete waste of time anyway, right? So unless we sort the ideas out, and God knows we don't all agree in this room, do we? So as far as I'm concerned, but... 
We haven't got long enough to have the full debate of everything that's ever happened in the history of the world or even the last 18 months. So I'm now going to whiz through. Yeah, OK, very quickly then. Just on, it does seem to me a bit um, contradictory if I was to say I've got a theory for why we shouldn't have theories. Um, but I, I, t I totally understand people who want a theory and who want to understand what's happened, right? It's been a big, major thing that's happened, whether it's only the reaction to it or, or, or whether it was the pandemic in the first place. This was big, and we were demobilised. We were sat at home, on our own, isolated, looking for explanations. And lots of people wanted to understand what was going on. And so they used their agency, as Sheila mentioned earlier, to try and work out what was going on. But a lot of the things that they tried to work out would not have passed the down the pub test, right? If we had not been isolated in our home and we'd been talking about how on earth to explain the situation we find ourselves in, we would not have ended up with, with grand theories and grand narratives. But it did strike me that some of the things that have been said today is um, uh, have been really helpful. I mean, I, I, I certainly think what you said, Alex, about we have one of the least trusted and least capable political elites. I think we can see that. Ella mentioned some of that before. The idea that they had, they came up with a plan. And they, and they wanted to Im impose that on the rest of us is just nonsense. When I talk about the political elite, I'm talking about them all over the world. Now, that doesn't mean they don't look at each other and see what's happening in Italy and what Macron's doing in France and what Ardern's doing in New Zealand. They, don't, they do talk to each other. They do kind of replicate each other, and they have the same economic interests. So it's not surprising that people around the world, global elites and all the rest of it, talk to each other. They're going to be doing that tomorrow in Glasgow. But that doesn't mean there's a plan. And I feel so disappointed that what um, Alex talked about, the popular upsurge of Brexit and Trump, and I agree with you, Corbyn, on the left to a certain extent, that we've forgotten that the, the political elite wanted to overturn that decision. They wanted to overturn that referendum. And so many of us in this room, and not everybody in this room, of course, um, got together and decided we weren't going to let them do that. We, we got out. We met one another. I've got some people I've never met before and, until, until we got together online to meet in person, really, and understand who we were as human beings and, and, and stop them from overturning that view. So I think we need to get back to some of that. Being in the room, does the Dan the Pub test work? And, you know, we don't... If, even if Cloud Schwab, whatever his face is, um, wants this agenda imposed on us, we don't have to let him. Yeah, thank you. Right, right, okay. I can't... Sorry. I can't bring you back in, sir, because I haven't taken people for the first time. So I'm now... That lady there. Right. Yeah, hi, just, just really quick points. Can we jettison the expression new normal and start all calling it the new abnormal? <laughs> second... <laughs> yeah. Just a second, a quick question, a, a quick point. I think for those of us who aren't scientists, science is hard. Those of us who are rubbish at science, most people don't understand science, which is virology, climate science. Um, most people don't understand data, probability, stats, it's maths, it's all hard. Most people aren't lazy and gutless, they're just confused. So... They're just trying to do the right thing. They're not sure if they're going to catch COVID from themselves, which is why they're driving the car on their own with their masks on still. Um, and then secondly, the face as the, as the heart of what it is to be human. Can we start getting back to that? That little children, toddlers, need to understand facial expressions as part of their development. Right, yeah. Uh, thank you. Firstly, on, on the new normal question, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that in my world, I am the only normal person. Um, <laughs> and I can say that I haven't changed at all, and therefore I can totally reject any new normal. Um, but on the, uh, the conspiracy uh, uh, part of the debate that's been going on, um, I was speaking to my daughter, who's 27 years old, uh, so she can cope, don't worry. Um, she was talking about the Alec Baldwin shooting of the, uh, of the film director, um, and she was reaching for, for conspiracy theories there. And I explained to her that first you've got to assume a mistake, second you've got to assume incompetence, and if all those tests fail, then you can go on to conspiracy. But what concerns me most is I think that the, the incompetency is more scary than the conspiracies. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So I've got that person there, and then that person over there has had his hand up for ages. I'm really sorry. Right, I just wanted to echo some of the things Mo Lovett said. Um, in terms of the cons conspiracy, actually, I think what um, Build Back Better and things like that really uh, illustrate is just the complete paucity of ideas about the future that 
the sort of political elites have. So like 15 years ago, it was nudge. Everybody was reading nudge. That's how they were going to reshape society without doing all those nasty things like bans and taxes and whatever. Then they realised it doesn't bloody work, and then we're back to bans and taxes and all that sort of stuff. You know, and, you know, I mean, probably if, were it not for the lockdown, most people wouldn't have heard of the Great Reset or all that sort of stuff, because actually it was just you know, the Davos talking shop, and that's the kind of stuff they, they normally come out with. And then we saw with lockdown, again, a complete paucity of, of ability to figure out what to do, so like everybody locked down apart from Sweden sort of thing, and then everybody attacked Sweden for not locking down while the... So, yes, yeah, so there's that. And then there's the, uh, in terms of the, the lockdown, I think what's interesting is just the trust, the lack of trust on both sides. So the government doesn't trust us when it says, we advise you to stay at home and, and trust us that we'll just stay at home or limit our social contacts for a time being. And we don't trust them because we think, well, hold on a second, why are you enforcing this on us? You know, so, so we don't trust you already over the whole Brexit stuff. Now we don't trust you just that you're being honest with us, even if maybe that was, that was possibly the best thing to do for three weeks or six weeks back in March 2020. I don't know. But the, it's that fundamental lack of trust between populace and government that uh, I think is really driving some of the sort of the, the idea that there's a big plan behind this all. Uh, and actually, I think it's really, really unhelpful in terms of so moving society forward when we have that lack of trust. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make a couple of quick uh, responses in the 15 seconds that I've got left. Um, just to say, you can probably tell from my accent uh, that I'm from the cradle of a liberal, uh, a liberalism and, and authoritarianism. Um, one of the things I wanted to say is this gentleman and, and one of the ladies over there talked about what can we do? And I think for me, it's been resistance from the very beginning, when you've got... I mean, we've been talking a lot about the UK government today, but the Scottish government really is verging on tyranny. And when... <laughs> when you... Op I mean, especially for someone like me, who, who loves the freedom and liberty that has essentially been born in Scotland and was poured out through the Western world, it's absolutely embarrassing to see our political leaders respond in the way that they have. I think when you're in that situation, you have a responsibility to resist. And what I've done since the beginning, just small things, I haven't ever owned a face mask, I haven't ever worn a face mask, I haven't taken the vaccination, and it hasn't just been a private resistance. I write for local press in Dundee, DC Thompson, which is kind of the one of the bigger uh, media companies in Scotland. And I wrote a year ago when it was very unpopular that I wasn't going to wear a face mask. There was 650 comments on the Facebook page within a couple of hours. Uh, I didn't even read them. A year later, um, I wrote that I wouldn't be taking the vaccination. Got reported to Ipso. Um, unfortunately, they, they stuck up for me. But it's about, for me, it's about finding ways in which we can resist and encourage others to resist. And one thing you refer to, which no one's touched on, Claire, is about political homelessness. I mean, I've been politically homeless for about 10 years, and I decided during lockdown to set up a political party to stand as a candidate for Holyrood in, 2020, uh, in 2021, and I will be standing for council uh, in 2022. We'll probably be dealing with, you know, bin collections and dog shit, but ultimately what it's about is digging into those local issues, getting connected to our local community, and, and rediscovering the, the democratia, which was the common people rule. These people that lead in Parliament, they represent us, and it's about us finding our voice again, finding a way to resist, speaking to okay, them, persuading okay, right, them. Right. Sorry. Okay. Um... I, I'm going to uh, ask the panel in reverse order just to give us their final thought. You know, the, the, the thing they want the audience to take away, um, this is, um, people keep saying, what do we do now? And what we do now is we go out and talk to each other. And part of the pub test that Mo referred to is when you actually have to argue with each other that's not, and not on Facebook and not on social media or the dark web, you'll find 
a different kind of atmosphere. So we should just be frank and open with each other and chat and then spend the rest of the day talking about other non-COVID things, but bearing in mind this as a backdrop. Uh, I, I did want to say to the gentleman who said, I don't know anyone who, who's died. Well, that's very fortunate for you. I'm afraid it's not the experience of many of us, right? A lot of us know. I, I, I'm afraid a lot of us know too many people who died. And also that on the polls, which are mysterious, I think that's a perfectly reasonable question, government by polling. But the idea that Nadim Zahawi has personally, you know, uh, uh, damaged all the polls. He doesn't own all the polling stations for a start off. And the reality is, is that huge numbers of people, the majority supported a lot of the lockdown measures for a long time. They're not sheeples. They're not made up. That's our fellow citizens and many of the people in this room. And that's reasonable. That's apparently reasonable, just because you don't agree with them. And if they don't agree with you or we don't agree with each other, it's up to us to persuade them. And the, one of the problems with being demobilised was we weren't able to have these conversations to persuade anyone. We were just looking at each other through poll figures. Now that we've got the chance to talk to each other, let's find out why we thought what we thought and then try and persuade each other, not kind of declaratory, this is the truth, but rather talk to each other and try and convince each other. That's what real democracy is about, and that's what this day is about, as an aside. So, let me start then with you, Graham. Your final thought um, uh, for this session, please. Democracy's hard. Um, it's hard at local level, uh, local government level, uh, at parliamentary level. I get lots of letters, emails nowadays, saying, you represent me and you voted this way. Uh, how can you do that? And uh, the next email will say exactly the opposite. It's, uh, it, it's a communication dialogue uh, process. And the answer to power is that people, and what the referendum on Brexit showed, whichever side of the divide you were on, is you can change things. There was virtually nobody in the establishment who wanted Brexit to happen. You may agree with them, but they didn't. Uh, all the political parties, the trade union movement, uh, by and large, the CBI, were all opposed to Brexit. And it happened because people got off the backsides, organised, talked, debated, and eventually voted. It's difficult. And getting the power back is doing that. It won't necessarily mean that your representative or government will do exactly what you want to do. But it's the only way you can get close uh, to influencing things. And just the final point I'd say to the lady who talked about science being hard. Parts of science uh, is hard. I got a science degree and parts of it were very hard. But Using science, and the point I was trying to make in the speech I gave, governments are using to try and stop you thinking. And you shouldn't suspend your own common sense because somebody says, this is science. I'll take one example about COP26. There are all these activists that are completely unnecessarily burning aviation fuel uh, to get to Glasgow. And they're all running around and saying... Uh, we mustn't get to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial uh, levels of temperature. Right? You don't need to be a scientist to know that that's a silly thing to say. It assumes that the temperature was at the same level in pre-industrial periods. If you'd been in Derbyshire or the UK in the mid-19th century, you know, it'd be freezing. We're way above one and a half degrees above where this country was. If you'd been in Newcastle when the Romans controlled Newcastle, then it's probably cooler now because they were growing vines in Newcastle and making wine. You don't have to be a scientist uh, to know that. Just don't suspend your common sense when people say, this is science, think about it. Um, yes, well, I think a young lady somewhere vaguely in that direction made a very good point. Uh, you know, what if we had a referendum on these measures? Um, you know, it would sort of bridge that almost insurmountable gap between the public and the media class, like with Brexit. That's why I brought Brexit up. Um, you know, to hear 
BBC speak, uh, the mouthpiece of the Guardian, or Sky News, the ring piece of the Guardian, <laughs> you'd, you'd, think that no, you'd, you'd think that no one opposes these measures at all. And yet, look at us now, gathering together to discuss what we are called, what we are told, so-called heterodox opinions, and yet the amount of people in this room would suggest they're not so heterodox as we're told. Thanks, James. Alexander. Yes, um, to, to, to conclude, I think that we have to reassert, and certainly this has made, the last almost two years has made re reassert the power and the usage of human reason, and that we have to believe in that and look to foster it in every occasion, because what we are seeing is the uh, ruling elites, ruling class, governmental circles, who have been gripped by irrationality for over two years, no matter what side of the debate on the COVID measures you fall on, you cannot say that they have been conducting themselves in a rational fashion. As Graham indicated, they have been hiding behind the science, which is a trademark and a brand. It's nothing to do with actual science or the method of scientific inquiry. They've been hiding behind that to shield themselves, as they have been for many years, because what they want to portray is that this order that, that, that does exist and has existed for certainly over the last 30 years is completely natural and can't be contested can never be contested because of the science, because of uh, we've reached the end of history or whatever else you want to, uh, whatever other, other phrase you want to use. And to, in order to defend that, they conjure up demons uh, that are contrasted to their own fading technocracy, be it terrorism, be it disease, be it climate change, none of which have ever explored properly and people are allowed to actually explore the genuine risks that are associated with those, but they are conjured up as these phantasms designed to scare people away from rational debate and inquiry. And we have to insist on that rational debate. We have to insist on defending some of the things upon which uh, the civilizations our political leaders claim to defend are built, like rationality, reason, and scientific inquiry. And we have to foster those in ourselves and our communities if we are to withstand a similar outburst of irrationality from our um, rather deranged ruling class ever again. Thank you. Jenny. I, I just think we, we have to keep asking why um, and recognising that I don't think we're in a position to answer that at the moment. I think it takes a lot of work. And I think one of the things that sort of happened over the past, well, I suppose, particularly 30 years, is there's been a sort of an assumption of the kind of world we live in and how politics works and how people are and shifts that are happening. But it's not really been properly interrogated. And I think now that, yeah, we recognise that quite a lot has changed and we don't understand it. And importantly, the people who, you know, whose job it is to understand it, like those of us who work in universities, um, not necessarily doing a very good job of it. And so we can't just leave it to them. And so I think that's why discussions like these, to me, are so good because um, I, I, you know, most people give their explanations for why. I don't agree with them, but I'm very, very pleased that people are asking the question because until we, you know, if we stop doing that, we're, we're never going to move on to try and approach a deeper understanding of all of the various issues, because it's not just COVID and lockdown, is it? I mean, all the stuff that we're discussing today, these are all kind of very, very big things that have come at us in quite a new way. So thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs>